coming on up with the table. Everyone say hi, Car- hi Carlisle. Yeah, that's right. Hey, uh, we are doing something extra special today as we continue on in our You Asked For It series. It is our last part uh, of the series itself. Over the course of June, people sent in 100 plus questions, all different types, a lot similar, uh, some very specific. And what we did is the last three weeks, we've answered three different questions, and some of those might have, you know, smaller questions uh, involved in those. Today, uh, we looked at what are the 12 questions that people most asked. And so we wanted to just do a rapid fire conversation with you. Here's the reality. It is a PG-13 series for a reason, service for a reason, because uh, the things we are dealing with are heavy. Some are fun, some are funny, uh, but others, uh, (laughs) it is just one of those things where, hey, man, we're going to talk about God's truth on certain matters. And so we just want to know where uh, we stand as a church. Um, And so what we're going to ask you to do is just lean in. You might already have a preconceived notion on on what you believe, uh, but I'm going to ask you to then compare that to what God says over the course of the next 35 minutes or so. So lean in, don't tune out, and don't walk out either. Rude. Okay? Now, (laughs) last thing I'll say is starting August 7th, if you have a junior hire, if you have friends who you know have junior hires, we are starting a junior high service at the 1030 service uh, here at Journey. What that looks like is simple. Worship for all junior hires, they're going to be in here. So we're going to probably sit right in this section right here for junior high. Uh, the reason is, man, this worship's awesome, and I want our junior hires to experience it, as well as I don't want to put something going on over there when worship is loud. So what we're going to do is after worship during this time, the host will excuse our junior hires out. They will have their own uh, message and groups, and it will end at 1130. So that's what we're going to do. If you have a junior hire, you know a junior hire, or you have friends who have junior hires, that's what we are going to to do. So with that, Justin is actually going to be Hi. our friend in Justin. the back. He's going to read the questions first, and then they're going to come up on the screen, uh, and then we're just going to see what happens. Everyone ready? Sounds good. Let's do it. All right. The first question, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? So let's start off with that. So quick answer, no, I don't think they did. But what they did have, I'm sure of it, washboard stomachs. Until they discovered sugarcane and cacao beans, because you know how that works for all of us. So, in Genesis 2-7, it says that Adam was created by God from the dust of the earth, no womb involved. So we just deduce that there was not a belly button involved. Uh, When we look at the creation, in all seriousness, the, the good part of the story is that we were created, humans were created distinctly and directly from God. So directly is the belly button question from the dust of the earth. Distinctly means that we, above all other creatures, with the exceptions of angels and demons, but even we have something that we'll talk about at the end of the service that they uh, don't have. We are the only creatures that contemplate God, that contemplate eternity. We're, We're the only ones that actually do that. So we contemplate God, we have a relationship with God, and we have the opportunity for eternity and a relationship with God that we call salvation through the work of Jesus Christ. So we are distinct. We have belly buttons now because of the womb, but we are distinct creatures made totally different from any other creature. Question number one, only 11 more to go. (laughs) Can babies get baptized? What is a good age for someone to get baptized? All right. So um, baptism is an outward expression of an inward commitment to Jesus Christ. So the only requirement for baptism is that someone has come to an understanding of what sin is, and they have this uh, observation that we talked about in the first question already, that they know who God is, and they know that they interrupted the relationship because of sin, and that God came to them in the form of Jesus as God and died for their sins. And so that's what baptism is, as a way for someone to acknowledge that I believe in Jesus as my Savior. And I'm declaring that in front of people that I know that I live with. So that's the only requirement. So what, how, what do we do with the, the, the kid baptism or infant baptism? So let me start with this. The answer already is we need to understand sin and its effects and the separation from God. Uh, when infant baptism started, it was a, an invention of the church as a reconciliatory step towards um, families, towards adults. It actually didn't start till the third century, well after baptism was such a big thing. And it was so that parents could be, have rest assured that their 
children, if they died too soon, too young, that they would have eternity with God. So what do we do with this? So the first thing is this, be assured that children are secure. They're secure. Scripture tells us that they're secure in so many places. So if your child dies before the time that they make the decision that I just talked about, it's an age of accountability, not a term in the Bible, but if they die before that, they're in the presence of Jesus. It, it says so. So we don't need to have heartburn about that. It's all good. It's all, all okay. So when does the child get baptized? When they come to a point in time in their life, in their walk, as you as their parents, uncles, aunts, friends, talk about Jesus and let them know about their decision. So when they make a decision and understand the symbolism, real quick symbolism, we're, we're in water, old self, without Jesus, we die like Jesus died. We go under the water, we're buried. We rise again to live with Jesus. If they understand that symbolism and they understand sin and separation from God, they're ready to get baptized. So that's the questions that we ask them. So we don't have an age. We don't say, mm, they, all that happens at five years old. We don't say that. It could be six years old. We've had five-year-olds baptized in our church. So it's a matter of a conversation that you as parents have with your children about sin and its effects and separation from God and understanding the symbolism of baptism. All right, question number two. If God was all-powerful, couldn't he destroy Satan? Yeah, I get this one uh, quite a bit from a lot of people. The simple answer is yes. So next question. No, um, so <laughs> yes, you could if, have. If Cam could only answer a question that short, wouldn't that right. be something? I know, right. <laughs> Right. A boom. I'll keep it up. Let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, and he turn. will, and, and scripture says in Revelation 2010, uh, that he will, and Satan and his cronies at one point in time, at the end of time, will be thrown into the burning lake of fire, never return. So the question is not, could have God destroyed Satan? The question should be, why hasn't God or why God didn't yet? So to answer that, we don't really have a clear cut answer in scripture. What we know is that God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And often we try to use human reasoning on a divine topic and we simply can't know the answer to everything. But what we know is this, is that God is sovereign and everything has been planned from the beginning of time to the end. That means what's coming to Satan will be the best outcome of God's righteousness and justice on Satan. We also know that God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. This is what I believe Paul writes in Romans 8. So we can trust God that even though Satan has freedom to steal, kill, and destroy right now, it won't be like that forever. We also have to understand that to question God's plan and timing is to question the character and nature of God himself. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be one to question him. So... Could God have destroyed Satan? Yes, and he will. But in the meantime, God's plan is at work. So that is a short answer to a complex question. Good work. Will we see our families' pets in heaven? <laughs> All right. That's me. We actually have these typed up. As you said, we want to be, as you see, we want to be concise. I don't know when I'm up, so I might ad lib. You never know what you're going to get. So in our eternal state... That's what we're really talking about. There will be animals. So let's start with that. Scripture tells us that. Um, and they'll provide for things for us like they do now. They'll bring, make us happy. They'll bring us pleasure. So it's conceivable that in eternity that there's going to be animals there, companions. But as far as your pets or my pets are concerned, not likely. We don't think so. There's nothing that actually says no. It's just how I answered that first question. We are the created creatures of all created creatures that choose, that understand God and choose righteousness. Pets and animals don't do that. So that's kind of the eternal thing is the whole God contemplation thing. So we, um, we're the only ones that turn to God, confess, repent of our sins, and turn towards righteousness. So that being said, it does seem like in Scripture that there's the, at least the possibility of pets because there's going to be animals. In Romans 8, 21, it says that all creation will be restored. Not just us. In Isaiah eleven six, it describes animals coexisting in the eternal state without conflict. So that's going to come together. There's other verses like that. So our eternal purpose is to worship and serve Jesus. That's what we're going to do in heaven. It's not like strumming guitars or harps on clouds. We're dedicated to Jesus. So in that, part of the second question about our family is, 
This is my wife. We're getting ready to spend our 37th anniversary together this week, Woo-hoo! okay? Woo. Now for me, uh, uh, job, to live Tina. life on earth is, is um, yeah, she's the, the better deal and put up with more for sure. Um, for me to imagine eternity without being married to Tina is really hard for me and hard to understand. But based on scripture, there's no marriage in heaven. Why? Because of what I just said. Because our eternal purpose is to serve and worship Jesus. So we're going to, the second question, will we see our family? Yeah. But the relationship's going to be better, it's going to be different, and it's going to be focused on Jesus. And so even then, let's say that uh, something happens and I die. And Tina, I know, I mean, look what she got. That she, <laughs> would she ever remarry? She could remarry. So when, when she gets there in the eternal state, uh, what, is it me? Is it him? Is it going to be a, a sister bride, brother bride <laughs> situation? And does she decide or do I decide? Are my focus there will be serving and worshiping Jesus? Okay? I'll learn to live with that. I'm going to be in the presence of Jesus. It's going to be great. The same can be said then for your pets. Tina and I, in the, in the course of our 37 years together, have had, I wrote down, um, about a dozen pets, um, eight Eight dogs that we've loved and that are great companions that we're devastated by when we lose them. So if, if our pets, those actual pets were there, are we going to like have a little Jesus court session for custody, for eternal custody? Uh, you get them for a thousand years, uh, we swap. That's she just, just not going to be the focus. She'll she get, would just get them. She would just get them. She would. They, they do like her better. I'm a little intense. I don't know if you noticed. So <laughs> that's how it's going to be. We, there's going to be animals, probably not our pets, and they'll probably provide some companionship. So there's things that are going to be different in eternity. That's really the, the essence of this question. We're going to be in the presence of Jesus, serving and worshiping him for eternity. Things that we can't imagine living without here, it's going to pale in comparison to what we will have there. That's good. That's the hope, and that's the faith that we have. That's good. Next question. Why do some people in the Bible get their name changed Ooh. after an encounter with God? This is a good one. Uh, I think all these are good ones, by the way. Thank you, by the way, for our church leaning in during this uh, series and sending in these questions. This is one that um, I always thought was interesting. So uh, whenever God changed the name, it was always for a purpose of signaling their name and changing it to a new identity that God has given them. Let me give you an example. Abram in Genesis was changed to Abraham, which means father of the multitudes. Now, we know eventually Abraham did become the father of multitudes, Israel, uh, and so on. Uh, Sari, which is his wife, Sarah, uh, means mother of nations, and she was the mother of many nations. Jacob to Israel, meaning having power with God, and one that we all know is Simon to Peter, meaning the rock. Uh, which is what Jesus built his church on. Peter was that rock. He was that person. You might ask, what about Saul to Paul? In fact, I was reading it all throughout the, uh, the book of Acts. Uh, we don't actually see Jesus change his name. Rather, there were similarities in the old uh, Hebrew way that those names could be interchangeable with one another. He just decided to roll with Paul after his conversion as a new identity. So people always often think about that one. I, I read that this week. I didn't even know that. And I studied the Bible for like 15 years. I'm like, oh, something new all the time. So A name change always had to deal with the identity God was giving them, changing their old identity to a new one. And the same goes for you and for me. It's just different. Our names don't change, but our identities do. See, when you believe in Jesus, you're given a new identity. It says in 1 Corinthians 5.17 that the old is gone and the new has come. Rather, you are clothed in Christ. You don't get a new name, but you have a new identity and purpose. Your purpose is to live like Jesus, be like Jesus to others, in the hopes that they would live and be like Jesus also. So when you read the Bible and you read uh, the New Testament, Old Testament, you're like, man, my name's lame. I wish I got something new. Uh, Just know in Christ, you are a new creation. In Christ, you have a new identity. And in Christ, you have a new purpose. So that would be the answer to that one. Why is homosexuality a sin? What if you have the same sex attraction but don't act on it? All right. So um, this is one of those PG-13 kind of moments. It's even going to get more PG-13 in a bit, so put on your, your um, seatbelts on that one. So in the creation account, there is a list of ordered things that God created and that God set into motion. 
and it was a finely tuned ecosystem, a spiritual ecosystem, a physical ecosystem, and it all came together very, very well. So among those that were created, it says in Genesis 1.17, as I already covered, male and female were distinctly created, different from each other, similar to each other, distinct from God, but also similar to God. So in all of nature, that is what God did, with very few exceptions. There is always male and there is always female. And there is always this provision for creation, procreation, making new babies or new animals that involve distinctiveness between male and female. Body parts validate it. Chromosomes validate it. So the natural and beautiful order of things set up for procreation, it actually set up for families, male and female, what the male brings, which we'll get into in a little bit, what the female brings, we'll get into that as well. And even social interactions spring from the distinctiveness between male and female. That's how God set it up. So homosexuality, along with other things, but homosexuality is a direct affront against the miraculous natural order that God put into place. So you don't have to go past the physical makeup and the purposes of humanity to see that it doesn't work. If males only got with males, no humans would be conceived in the natural order of things. We know now things can happen, but that's not the natural order. If females were only with females, it wouldn't continue. We would become extinct. So the natural attraction thing, this is how I address it. We all, including me, have natural attractions to things that are opposite of what God's intentions are. That's called sin. It's called the sin nature. The attraction is not the sin. The action to the attraction is the sin. You got it? So what that means is if we give ourselves over in Romans chapter 1, it says that God gave us over to our unnatural desires and inclinations, and we had to live with the ramifications. And we had been living with them before that, and we still are. So giving ourselves over to the things God did not design them for is another definition of sin. Giving ourselves over to things that we're attracted to that are against the natural order of what God set up is also known as sin. And it leads to things dying in us and around us. So just as I'm saying, if men only were with men, it would die. If women were only with women, it would die. As we get into this more and more, even today, we want to have conversations about this. But we're going to the Bible, and that's what the Bible says. How do you put God first in your marriage? It's me again. Take me, take me. All right. So um, I have a, an easy answer uh, that's complicated, but it's just a basic formula that I like to use. Um, I'm not an expert, even though, like I said, 37 years, um, I know how to be married to her. We were just talking uh, in the lobby. I was talking with Donna. I don't know where she's at, about how hard it would be. I know I'm super hard to live with, and Tina's figured it out. Um, so, with all that to say, I'm the perfect husband. You're supposed to, uh, uh, no. Okay, this is what I am, though. I am an image bearer, a male image bearer of God. Tina is a female image bearer of God. So, PG-13 moments here. You ready? You're going to say, why did you pick those words? I'm picking graphic words in a moment, so you'll remember this part. So, the Hebrew word for male is the one who remembers God well the vision caster, the one who remembers God well. The word for female in Genesis, in the creation account, is actually the one who is pierced, okay? So to make it PG and not PG-13, the one who surrounds well. The male is the one who remembers God well. The female is the one who surrounds well. So graphic moment. When male and female, as we just got done talking in the homosexual answer, when they come together... You ready? PG-13. <laughs> I hope your kids are prepared for this. Talks afterwards. When the man stands erect, the woman surrounds the man. Graphic moment. We can handle it. It's the same with life. When the man remembers God well and stands erect, remembers God well, the woman surrounds and nurtures and brings life to the vision and the purpose that God gave them. Good. You get it? The man stands erect, the woman surrounds it and brings life to it. 
So in Ephesians, in the New Testament, that cycle is continued in what we call the love and respect cycle. When a man is respected, he behaves the best. When a man is disrespected, he behaves the worst. Totally true with me. When the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, it's because I got disrespected. When the woman is loved, she behaves the best. When a woman does not feel loved, she misbehaves. It's this cycle. So that reflects the Hebrew word for male and the Hebrew word for female, respect and love. So here's the thing. Graphic moment again. This is what happens in marriages. I've been a counselor and a pastor for over 30 years. This is always the case, always the case when a marriage is in trouble. The man is flaccid in life. Graphic word, I want it to be graphic. When the man does not stand erect, provide vision and purpose for his family and for his wife, the woman does not know what to surround. And it's in her very nature to surround things. And if she does not find something to surround, she will surround something. And that's the beginning of deterioration in marriage. So the challenge for men, <laughs> quit being flaccid in life, spiritually speaking, vision speaking. Stand erect, remember God well, and let your wife be the image bearer of God that she is. So there you have it. Graphic moment. You'll remember that one. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Give me a second. <laughs> How can Recovered we love the that? sinner and hate the sin? Now, I'm surprised you, uh, you, you, you removed the image you were going to throw up on the screen for the last question. <laughs> so, uh, this is one that we get a lot. I've, I've talked to a lot of you, and I've talked to a lot of parents throughout, the way, uh, throughout our church who ask questions. You know, my, my child or someone I know is in sin. How do we do this? Yeah. Here's the reality is that uh, this is what a lot of non-Christians or people who think they are Christians use this all the time. Why can't you just love the sinner? And, and, and hate the sin. Or why can't you just love me in general? Following Jesus is what they'll say is just loving. It's not judgment or judging them. Because if someone is open in sin and you are a Jesus follower, do not condone their actions or lifestyle. Whatever it is, they call you judgmental and they will say things like, if you call it out, they will say things like, well, Jesus would just, what, love me, right? Uh, why can't you? Or they would say, your words are attacking me. Your words are violence. And I just believe all that is nonsense. Meanwhile, they have no regard for how you feel when they bash your faith in Jesus and how you live your life. So how do we love the sinner and hate the sin? It's easy. The same way Jesus did. First, we have to realize that you and I are sinners also. Even though you are saved, you are still sinning, similar to a recovering alcoholic. You're always in recovery. But you are saved, and that does not make you better than somebody else. That just makes you realize what others who are not Jesus followers are missing. Jesus loved everyone but compromised for no one. I say this over and over again. He loved people where they were at and challenged them to be his followers. We see this in two main stories. In John chapter 4 and John chapter 8, Jesus is sitting at the well with the woman, and he's having a conversation with her, and all of a sudden she con or he confronts her sin. Uh, he says, hey, you have had five husbands. Going back to that first story, which husband is it? Uh, uh, you know, uh, husband brothers, right? Uh, and you have had five husbands, and the man you're living with is not your husband. And all of a sudden, he goes, go and sin no more. And then she becomes the first evangelist in her town that says, come and listen to a man who's told me everything I've ever done. She didn't view it as judgment. She viewed it as confrontation, and she viewed it as the opportunity to change her life. And in fact, later on, that's where the feeding of the 4,000 was that in that same city. So she was the first convert, went and told people, and the next time Jesus came, 4,000 people came and visited him. Again, in John chapter 8, a woman caught in adultery. You might know this story. The religious leaders are like, hey, let's stone her. Uh, and Jesus says, those of you without sin be the first to throw a stone. And they all fall away. And he just tells the woman, woman, where are, your, where are your accusers? And she says, nowhere. And he goes, well, neither do I accuse you or condemn you, rather. Go and sin no more. That is not judgment. That is love. Love does a lot of things. Maybe you've been to a wedding, and in 1 Corinthians 13, we see it. But people often miss the verse where it says, love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. Love does not approve of sin. Love does not turn a blind eye to sin. Love does not rejoice in sin. 
So we can love people and tell them the truth to Jesus, and if they don't listen, it is not you they are rejecting, but it is Jesus they are rejecting. So just love them. Be there for them. Check in. But listen, do not compromise to their life or lifestyle, and do not pretend like it doesn't exist. You have the cure to the ailment, so give it to them. Next question. What is the difference between progressive Christianity and progressing in your faith? And this is a cam question through and through. Yeah, yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, this is going to be a shorter one than usual because I've got a long one coming up. Uh, this is a good clarifying question. Uh, let's define some terms here. What is progressive Christianity? It is a new movement over the past few decades that has a low view of Jesus. He is an example for us in the faith, but he is not the whole encompassing Savior in which we are to submit to. Progressive Christians focus more on being moral than being saved. Progressives have a small view of sin. And progressive Christians want God's love without submitting to God's truth. They bend the knee to the culture, so to speak, so that they are not offensive to anyone. In doing so, progressive Christians are not biblical Jesus followers. They do not believe in the gospel. In fact, they preach an entirely different one. Therefore, I would say they are not actually Christians based off of their theology, based off of their ideology, and based off of their idols. Progressing in your faith is growing in your faith. Similar to playing an instrument, you progress at the level in which you put into it. Growing in your faith means you are walking deeper with God, having a closer relationship with Jesus, and being changed by the Holy Spirit by the inside out. You should never remain where you are in your faith. You should grow in understanding of Scripture, be transformed by the Holy Spirit, uh, and help others in their faith as well. Progressing in your faith does not have a mountaintop. It is Paul who says in Philippians 3 that it is not something you attain. Rather, we have to forget what is behind us and strive for what is ahead. Progressing in your faith simply means living a life that reflects Jesus and submitting your life and lifestyle to the ways of Scripture. Carlisle, do people who commit suicide go to heaven? So the answer is, it doesn't depend on how their life ended. So in order to do this, we have to look at what Scripture says, and Scripture never says this. This is one of those delicate PG-13. You don't want to empower suicidal ideation and say, it's okay, you'll go to heaven. But it's okay if you're a believer, if you have faith in Jesus, which we've talked about how many times already this morning. Uh, that is not the thing that takes you uh, away from God for eternity to be with Jesus. The thing that takes you away from God is rejecting the free gift of salvation. Jesus said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And he said, who the Father has given me, no one can snatch out of my hand. Out of my hand. So suicide, becoming the spiritually mortal sin condemning you to hell, is something that the church invented. Let me tell you about it. You're, you're not going to like it. It's a church invention. So it's connected to purgatory. It's an add-on to purgatory. Purgatory is also something the church invented. Purgatory is a way when you came and confessed your sins in the Catholic church back in the day, you would be given things to do. So in order to create an economy in the church, you could have an exchange. You could say, okay, so this many Hail Marys or this, this, this would be how much money? Can I just pay you? And they said, yeah, we need some money. So this purgatory system came about when you had an account in arrears. You were in the red for the church because of your sins, and you died. You would go to purgatory to work off your sins, okay? Not biblical. So then what started to happen is uh, they would go to the families. So if I was in purgatory and committed sins, they would go to Tina and say, you owe the church like taxes, sin taxes. You owe this much money. And so suicide was a way to stop all of that because dead people can't pay penance. Get it? Dead people can't pay penance. So they invented it to try to deter people away from committing suicide because they needed the money. It was an economic engine. Isn't that tragic? Isn't that wrong on so many levels, exploiting people's all kinds of things, spirituality and their economy? So the Bible is clear that we live once and we die once. 
Hebrews 9, verse 27 says that, which also debunks reincarnation. You didn't ask that question, but that's bunky too. Just do the math. Don't even go to the Bible. Do the math. It just doesn't work out. So our eternal destination is based on what? You've heard about it several times over the last weeks. Based on the work of Jesus and your belief in the work of Jesus. About you hearing about Jesus as the Savior of your soul and responding and receiving that. Not and how your life ends. Kim, what is Journey's opinions on abortions and contraceptives? Your mic is muted. Perfect. Is it now? Perfect. All right, so this is going to be the longest answer for the day, and rightfully so. You see, uh, th- we got this question in many different forms over the course of the past uh, month, especially with the amazing news coming out of the Supreme Court with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Now, here's the thing. As a church, we celebrate the fact that this is a first step in the, pre- or in the protection of the pre-born, and we are going to be unapologetic on that. And so this is what I'm going to say. Uh, and I'm going to ask you not to tune us out, as a lot of people would, but have a discussion. You see, the reality is, is that as a church, we don't have an opinion on this topic, on these topics. We have God's truth on this topic. Our stance isn't rooted in how we feel. It's rooted in what God has already said. God's truth is greater than man or woman's opinion. God's truths take precedence over anyone's feelings. Many churches and pastors you know apologize to people or preface with an apology when it comes to these topics. My friends, it is time more than ever to be unapologetic truth tellers in the church. And we need men and women to boldly speak truth in a fallen world. So I'm going to answer this and it's going to be a little longer. But I'm going to start with the latter, contraceptives. Now, you might ask, Cam, are you the right person to ask this? (laughs) You've got four kids under seven. Your last one was a blessing uh, who will be born in September. Do you even know what a condom or birth control is? (laughs) He doesn't. And I would say, yes, I do. And I know the statistics that 99% of the time they work. But my friends, I'm here to declare, I am the 1%, okay? So where does the church stand on contraceptives? A sexual relationship within the confines of a marriage between a man and a woman. The way that God has created it, commissioned it, we say, use them. Condoms and birth control are forms of contraceptives, like, uh, like, and they should be used if it if you feel like it. I cannot find in Scripture a great argument against such things. But once again, any and all sexual activity in the view of God in Scripture is only seen as sacred in the confines of a marriage between a man and a woman. All others, homosexual, heterosexual, not married, are viewed not as sacred, but sinful. See, God doesn't hate sex. That's what a lot of people think. God doesn't hate sex. Rather, he created it. In the garden, he tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. Then after the fall, he says to Eve that childbirth is going to be painful, but afterwards, your wife is still going to desire her husband. Now, anyone who's been through birth might think, I don't know how that happens, but God said it. And in fact, Proverbs 5 has a whole portion focused on loving the wife of a youth, and it even says, let her breasts always satisfy you. And all my married men said? Amen. Okay. And Solomon wrote a whole letter in Songs of Solomon to his first wife that says some pretty out-of-pocket stuff if you're a prude, okay? Now, why am I focused on sex here? The reason is because how we view sex and the sanctity of it determines our views on all different expressions of sex. That is what we call a watershed moment. This idea that when water hits a roof, it either goes to the left or it goes to the right, it cannot go forward. It then informs and determines where the water goes. It it informs and determines where it goes. In the same way, what you believe the point of sex is informs and determines your beliefs about all the outcomes of sex. So the question is, What is the point of sex biblically? 
It is two things, for reproduction and pleasure. For reproduction and pleasure. Reproduction is easy. God's design for sex inside of marriage between a man and a woman is number one for reproduction purposes, to be fruitful and multiply. And all throughout history, where there is a strong family nucleus and people have followed a sexual ethic as outlined in Scripture, the family, the community, and the nations have been strong. And it's for pleasure because, I mean, praise be to God. <laughs> The problem lies in the fact that when cultures and nations disregard God's sexual ethic and the degradation and downfall of that culture or nation or empire always follows. When sex is no longer viewed as a man and a woman and only viewed for personal pleasure, culture becomes perverted, families are weakened, and nations crumble. We are seeing it here in our nation as we are seeing even adults want to talk about their sex and sexuality in kindergarten classrooms. Uh, our culture views sex as for my pleasure, so I will use who I want, when I want, how I want it, and I will fulfill any fantasy that is to my heart's desire. And that process on sex informs and ultimately determines our views on contraceptives and abortion. And in our culture and in our nation, we don't view condoms, birth control, or other methods as our only view of contraceptives. In fact, 65 million deaths would contribute to the fact that we believe that abortion is a form of contraceptives. And here's the reality, friends. There is a major difference between preventing a pregnancy and ending a pregnancy. And we can have all sorts of conversations as to whose choice it is. And say, yeah, but what about scenarios? And here's the reality. I have had these conversations, and I have been called every name in the book, and people have wished the most heinous actions on me and my family for my views. As it turns out, people don't want to hear your views on the matter. They want to hear their opinion coming out of your mouth. Statistically, 98% of all abortions happen for the sake of convenience, we view sex only as pleasure, and then we are shocked when a woman gets pregnant. And most of the time, people think, I never thought this would happen to me. In a similar scenario, say I'm going skydiving. I throw on my parachute, and I jump out of an airplane. And as I'm falling, I go to deploy my chute, and it doesn't open. And so I get my back up. I go to deploy my chute, and it doesn't open. And I smack the ground, and somehow I live. And you come visit me in the hospital. And I said, hey, wonder what, friend? I never thought that would happen to me. And you're the one saying, dude, you jumped out of an airplane. How did you not think that this was a possibility? The same goes for sex. Its, its purpose is reproduction. We run the risk when we engage in the act. And interestingly enough, the same people who yelled on TV and virtue signaled on social media all throughout the pandemic and shouted, follow the science, follow the science, follow the science, have turned a blind eye to the scientific fact that life begins at conception. The baby is an autonomous and separate human being who has a soul at the moment he or she is conceived, connected yet separate from his or her mother. A person is a person no matter how small they are. And they will yell and shout, it's your body, your choice, except for the fact that it isn't uh, a choice for their body. They're making a choice for the child's body and life. And they will say, you're a man, no uterus, no opinion, unless, of course, in the instances where men can get pregnant. And it's a woman's issue, but they can't tell us what a woman is. So stay out of it, men, except for the fact it isn't a woman's issue. It's a human rights issue. That would be like someone coming up to me and saying, hey, you're not a sex trafficker, nor are you being trafficked, so you have no say in this matter. I view it as a garbage argument. The church has to speak on this topic because when the church loses its voice, culture loses its conscience. I will say this as a church. We believe that abortion kills a baby, that abortion is evil, and that abortion is sinful. Abortion is a leading cause in America, and it's not even close. See, abortion isn't immoral because certain politicians and people call it wrong. Abortion is immoral because a person who is formed in the image of God is unjustly denied the opportunity of life. And so we will fight for the things of God just as God fights for people who cannot fight for themselves. 
Unborn babies are innocent and do not have a voice to speak, so we will speak for them. I will also say that abortion is not the unforgivable sin. You might ask yourself if you've had an abortion or know someone who's had one or have encouraged somebody to get one, do they have a seat at the table of God? And the answer is absolutely yes. Because even your father in heaven knows what it's like to lose a son. And your action is no match for God's great grace. Mm -hmm. Here at Journey, you have a seat at our table. You are welcomed here and you'll be loved here and there'll be no shame for us here. Just as if you are a single woman who is pregnant. You're welcomed here, loved here, and you'll find no shame here. What you will find is people who love you and care for you and are willing to come alongside you and serve you however we can. You can find forgiveness and healing and restoration in Christ Jesus when you repent of your sin and life and life, and you'll be given life and life to the fullest. Lastly, I would say, if you are a Christian, it is impossible to be pro-choice and think the way that God thinks when it comes to life. To think that God forms and its baby in the womb, knows and intimately uh, or knows them intimately before they are born, plans out the years and knows every hair on their head. And God that was in, or that Jesus, the unborn Jesus was in the, in the womb of his mother Mary, went and visited her pregnant aunt Elizabeth. It was the unborn John the Baptist who first left at the presence of his Lord. Life does not begin at first breath. Life begins at the moment of conception. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. The children are a blessing from the Lord so that anyone who believes in him would have life and life to the fullest. And you cannot have life to the fullest if you are killed in the womb. I don't know how someone can reconcile the differences believing in a pro-life savior and have a pro-choice mindset without bending and compromising the truth of God to the lie of culture. As always, anyone has a seat at our table, and we love you, and we care for you. You are loved and cared for. Anyone who walks into our church is loved and cared for, and we will have any conversation but because we have such a high view of God and his ways, and because we have submitted to our lives to Christ and the Holy Spirit, we will talk about anything. But friends, we will compromise on nothing. That's where we stand. All right. And Carlisle, the last question, and I think also a very important question. When Jesus returns to earth, will there be any second chances for unbelievers that do not have faith in him? Okay. So the answer, um, I'm going to try to make it short and simple. It depends on how you view something called the millennial reign of Christ. So when you get into eschatology, which is the study of end time stuff, there's a couple of different views. The millennial reign of Christ is a, reign, a thousand year reign of Christ. Some people uh, believe that that is already happening in that it happened when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father and that this millennial reign of a thousand years is a spiritual reign. I don't believe that. I believe that the millennial reign of Jesus will be actual, that Jesus will actually be here on earth. I think we spiritualize way too many things that really need to be actual things. So in Revelation 20 and 21, it says that Jesus will reign here on earth. We will be uh, communing with him. And then there is this cool thing that happens. Satan will be bound for that time. So people will experience the full reign of Jesus on earth for a period of time. And then that period of time will end. People will be coming to know who Jesus is. So yes, they'll get to believe. Then Satan will get to have one last hoorah, an evil hoorah. And people, it says, this blows my mind to think about, people that have been actually in the presence of Jesus will side with Satan, but they will lose. And then judgment happens. The great white throne judgment that we read about in Revelation, uh, everything will end. Hell will then be open for business with eternal inhabitants. Heaven and the new earth will be open for business with eternal inhabitants, as we already talked, serving and worshiping Jesus for eternity. So people will choose even then someone other than Jesus. Hard to believe. So this is where I want to end us. 
You know, this, this, maybe this was hard for some of you. We, we know that it's risky. One of the elders we were talking with earlier this week, that there might be some reaction. And I said, what do you mean, reaction? Well, maybe you're reacting. It's okay. We can have reactions. But as Cam already said, we are a relationship church. And in the confines of relationship, in, in the beauty of relationship, we have conversations. So don't get ruffled and leave over this. If there's something that you want to talk more, then let's talk more. As we say, there's a a room, there's room at the table to discuss any of these things. So settle down. If you're riled up, settle down. Let's just have some conversations. This all is a progression. We didn't have these um, answers in a snap. We went to God's Word and sought the answers out. There's really two important questions. I'm proud of you for your questions, by the way. They're deep questions, important questions, but there's really only two important questions. All of these really go back to two questions. Who do you say Jesus is? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Have you secured your spot because of what Jesus did, the completed work of Christ for your soul? Have you received him as a Savior? If you haven't, please talk to us because it could be your moment. The other question that we need to ask is what difference does that make now? You hear us say all the time, Jesus didn't just die for our eternity. He died for our Monday. How are we living now for Jesus? Those are the two important questions. This other stuff is important, but these are even more important. So um, let's answer those two questions. And if you want to talk to us about those two questions, we'd love that even more. Uh, So we're going to do two things real quick before we end. Sorry that we're a little over. This was important. This was good. We're going to watch a quick video because we're starting a new and important series next week called the I Am. We're going to introduce it next week, and then we're going to do the seven statements from the book of John that Jesus said who he is. If we're a relationship church, we need to have a relationship with Jesus. We're going to learn how to do that. We're all doing it together, uh, the journey groups, so it's time to sign up for groups. Groups are starting in two weeks from today, that week. All the groups are doing it. Journey Kids is doing it. Journey Students is doing it. We're all doing this together. So let's watch this video that talks about it a little bit, and then I'll do one more thing after that.